Yo, 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 welcome to Crate 808. And today we have a very special guest sitting down with us, an artist who pushed it along and told us all about Linden Boulevard represents, a guy who makes love to the mic like he does to the phone, the mystic man himself, an original member of Tribe Called Quest, Jerobi, A-E-I-O-U, and sometimes Y is in the house. Mr. Jerobi White, how are you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic, man. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, I'm good. Blessed to have you on, man. I know you don't do many interviews, so it's a pleasure to chat with you. Hey, um, before we start, can I say something really quickly? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I lost a really good friend of mine, uh, Vice Versus. Mm-hmm. He's from um, uh, End of the Week. End of the Week is an international hip-hop battle mm-hmm. for underground artists, and it's been running for 19, 20 years in New York City. And it's a place for unsigned underground rappers, to come and do their thing end of the week and he just passed and it's a very big loss to the hip-hop community and my friend yeah mate i i i, I uh, appreciate you shouting that out because end of the day for me stuff like that what you're doing is it's the lifeblood of our culture if you know what i mean we have very very separate lives me and yourself so hearing someone who's passed that was a part of the lifeblood of the culture in another neighborhood that i not i may not have heard of you know yeah i, I appreciate you shouting that out and uh R.I.P., man, R.I.P. Word, definitely. Not to start off in a bad tone, you know what I'm saying? No, because man, no. If, if you got to say something off your chest, mate, we're here. Like, you know, uh, we don't hear a lot from you anyway, man. That's the thing. So to hear you say stuff like that, it resonates, mate. It resonates, definitely. Thank you, thank you brother. Yeah, Thanks, it's brother. all good, man. It's all good. But um, to, to lift, the, lift it up, though, I was going to say to you, as you've come on the podcast, we have some precious time with you. One of the things that we always ask every guest who comes on, I'm going to ask it you as well, man. What's the least hip hop thing you've done in the last 24 hours? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, man, so many things. Um, I was, <laughs> I was just showing, um, my wife was having a, a neck problems mm. and I was, show- and I was showing her to stretch and she was like, yo, you did that too well, bro. Like you look like a dancer. <laughs> like, you- <laughs> like, like I was gonna start doing, like I was gonna start doing ballet or modern dance. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, let's not sleep on Jerobi's moves in those tribe videos, everyone. All right, those you know what moves, I'm saying? <laughs> those moves. I'm not lying. I, 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 I can get down with that. I can get down with that. Uh, so yeah, I feel it. I feel it. And you know what? Helping a spouse always good, man. Always good. I mean, it's it's lockdown, right? And. How how are you dealing with it? How how are you dealing with it right now? Well, um, it's not that hard for me because I don't really go out much anyway, so it's not that difficult for me. Yeah. But um, like man, not it's it's cool. Like I'm with my wife and my and my kids, and I, you know, those are people I like to be around the most anyway. Yeah, it's cool. It's a lot of time for reflection, uh, time to strengthen the family bonds if you're together. You know what I'm saying? All all of these things are are a good side benefit of this thing. Um, it's just inconvenient because you know I'm a chef and I love to eat and I'm I miss restaurants. But aside from that, aside from that, it's cool, man. You know, I can imagine because I was thinking of yourself when when we were about to jump into this. I was like, wow, lockdown for someone who loves to cook. How is that doing? How are you doing with that? Are you getting more creative? Are you like limited with your ingredients now because you don't go shopping as much? Or how, how is that playing out? What's the cuisine saying? Well, I mean, I uh, we always stay well stocked anyway. So I wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big thing. Just picking up like, um, you know, the little essentials like toilet paper and stuff like that is a bit challenging because everybody goes into panic mode. It's like buying all these things up. But, you know, uh, at least I try to stay well stocked anyway because my wife is a pastry chef as well. So, so we're just getting down here all the time. <laughs> so, so there's usually food and, and ingredients here you know what i mean so it wasn't that big but, um i'm not having that big i'm not having that big of a struggle during this coronavirus lockdown thing man mm. and I, i'm gonna be honest with you sometimes i feel a little guilty you know what i'm saying because like, i do know people who are struggling you know what i mean you know, and people who have hurt dealing with um you know this illness in their families and things like that and i, I feel for them and um it hasn't touched me directly but you know, I know people who've lost family members to it. And I know people who had it, but most everybody I know is recovering, thankfully. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, but I do know I do know those horror stories. And, you know, sometimes I feel, you know, a little survivor's guilt for a lot of shit. You know what I'm saying? For my success, man. You know what I'm saying? But you know what, though, Joby? You're saying that now about, like, feeling that guilt. The other side to that coin is the fact that the music that you guys made on a personal level, that stuff is helping. I can get lost. Just this morning, 
my kids there, I'm getting stressed, work, the podcast, you know, that kind of thing. Do you know, I thought, yeah. you know what, I'm going to put some tribe stuff on and lift the mood and me and my kid dance for like a half hour solid to like your old school videos from the early 90s. And it helped. It genuinely helped. The climate in the house, like the dark clouds lifted. And I was thinking... I really appreciate that we have this as as heads who, you know, this is this has changed our lives and it's still helping. So for all that stuff of you feeling guilty, just just know out here that us fans, we really appreciate all the stuff you guys did and yourself as well. And so there's two sides to that coin, man. And you shouldn't feel too guilty because uh, the majority of us are in that stage. And uh, yeah, man, it's it, it's sad. It's sad. And yeah, we just got to keep doing it. For We just got to, you know what? It's not the hardest thing. Just stay home. That's all we gotta do, man. It's not hard, man. You know, it's not hard. And um, and also, I would like to—I just wanted to say, just speak on that really quickly. It, it's extremely fulfilling and humbling to hear you say shit like that, man. You know what I'm saying? It's like we were—we were little kids. We were just trying to escape all the darkness around us. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, it's fucking mind-boggling that it still resonates. 30 years later you know what i mean it's insane we're making that music in our teens bro it's insane but this this that's the thing though like when i see that youthful energy of like subcultures and like art forms that pop up just sporadically a lot of them may not last because the people grow up and you kind of shed a lot of that stuff that, right. that happened right of course there's something about what you guys all did from run dmc to ll to yourself to yeah man. There's yeah, something you guys created after the awful hand that has been dealt to the culture that, that birthed hip hop, the history, everything that jumped, that basically surmounted a massive, like, you know, we don't give a fuck about you guys and you guys have to, yeah. and to crawl out of that. And they're not just crawl, but stand and salute and be head and shoulders over the other cultures. This is the longest lasting culture, man. Like, I hate to yeah. gush about it. I do this every podcast, but this is this is a culture that's going to live forever. Like, you can just tell. My kid loves it. I yeah. love it. My wife loves it. You know, that kind of thing. So Yeah, because me and my buddies me and my buddies talk about there's no heavy, heavy metal anymore. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And that was, that was huge for us when we were little. Heavy metal and punk, those things were huge, and they kind of died down. You know what I'm saying? Because the music doesn't speak to us in the same way, I would say. I think the music now for rap, because it was so dense and so layered, you can easily mm-hmm. look at 90s, early 90s rap and look at the misogyny and the homophobia and, and talk about that. Or you can talk about it and say, there's life lessons in what Tip, Fife and yourself were spitting and making. And not just not just the spitting, but the beats. They evoke emotion out of you, man. And that's and that honestly is, is a thing that I think music, we should really raise our heroes up. And as people say, give them their flowers now, man. And so that's why that's why it's nice to have you here and to just talk this through, man, and just give our listeners an insight into Jerobi White's like journey. Your journey's fascinating to me, man. Thank you, bro. No, nah, it's all good. I mean, as I say, it's fascinating. Let's just start the jump off. Why hip hop? Tell me what 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 did you find in hip hop that you couldn't find in anything else? Okay, so the beginning process. Okay, so, well, for us, well, let me just speak for me, I guess. Um, there were a lot of different um, forms of music that were around in our day that were beautiful. Like, you know, the Stevie Wonders, the Earth and the Fires of Prince, and things like that, Marvin Gaye's. That's what we were trying to be. And we weren't really, we weren't really trying to be a rap group or hip hop necessarily, but hip, hip, hop, hip hop was our medium of expression. Right. You feel me? Mm-hmm. In the early 80s in New York City, late 70s, early 80s, they started uh, defunding all the music programs. You know what I mean? So, like, I started in school, like, fifth grade, sixth grade, playing an instrument. By the time eighth grade came, there was no more music classes in the school. Damn. Just so for the UK listeners and the European listeners, eighth grade is what age? What age is this? Oh, eighth grade is 13. So that's really young. Okay. Yeah. So, like, from 9, 10, 11, I was playing instruments, clarinet, you know, and I played the clarinet. And um, after that, after I went to um, the next level of schools, which is like either junior high or intermediate, which is like seventh, eighth grade, mm-hmm. all the music was gone. Damn. So it, it left a lot of children, a lot of kids in New York City with musical inclinations with no way to express it. Because you can't just walk out and buy a $400 trumpet. Most families, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Or a violin, which is probably even way, was even more expensive back. You know what I'm saying? We, we didn't have that access. So we started 
taking, we started using all the things that were around us. And the things that were around us were our parents' records. And already in New York City, in hip hop, they had the break part in the records mm. where either it was a funky loop or funky drum beat in the middle or towards the end of a record or something like that, like a bridge or something like that. You know what I mean? Or a breakdown. So we started, um, they started rapping and breaking over those. And then synthesizers came into the game. But again, a lot of kids didn't have access to synthesizers. So we had to take it even further and started using the musical components of the songs, the melodic components of the songs now to combine and make our own things. And that's, that's that's how it started. That's a fast. That's fascinating because because you're right. It, it's it comes down to the circumstances you live in and having no instruments. Then you look at how you guys made that art form and you saw how it was blowing up. I mean, you lived through an era that blew up, like LL, Run DMC, Def Jam. Generally, your yeah. relationships to those guys as a fan. What was what did they bring to your life that you hadn't had before? Well, okay, so I moved to Queens in eighty three. I say eighty two, eighty three. And Run DMC had the first record out, Rockbox or something like that. No, Sucker MCs. I'm sorry, Sucker MCs. I'm Sucker MC. And um, that changed, like, we were in the sixth grade, seventh grade, changing classes. And somebody, you have three minutes in between classes, somebody in the hallway would turn their radio on and blast it in the hallway for those three minutes until we went to the next class. God damn, that's amazing. That's how influential that song was. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's crazy. That is crazy. So then um, my neighborhood started getting rough. I lived in Co-op City in the Bronx, which is, you know, um, the Bronx was notoriously legendarily fucked up. Mm-hmm. So uh, my parents <laughs> moved us out of the Bronx and moved to Queens. And uh, it looked to me like I came from like living in kind of an upgraded housing project, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, you know, I, I'm coming from that and moving to Queens, with the lush neighborhoods and the, and the grass and all that stuff. I was like, yo, where do my parents have me? You know what I mean? I'm like, where do my parents have me? And then I stumbled into, uh, I met this guy who had turntables. He's like, oh my God, finally hip hop. Then he, he, then he introduced me uh, to Fife because he's like, yo, this is another guy who's the most hip hop guy I know. It's fine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Snap, yeah. And mind you, and mind you, we're eleven. I'm eleven. He's twelve. That's crazy. That, <laughs> you know that, what I'm that's formative years, mate. I'm eleven and he's twelve. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know anything about the neighborhood I'm living in really yet. Um, five. We start. Me and five start. Uh, start kicking it. I'm doing a beatbox. He's rapping. He's like, "Yo, you gotta meet my boy." And, and bring, he brings me the tip, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, five grandmother lived uh the next block away from me where i lived but his mother lived in tips neighborhood so then we started venturing over there and then i started realizing like yo run dmc lives down the block l o cool j i just saw him and so we're like yo this is this is real if these guys are doing it we can do it too you know what i mean and having that in a neighborhood and the neighborhood we lived in we lived in a neighborhood called st albans adisley adisley park in queens our neighborhood was an uh, absolute bastion of black excellence in the music world, and just in the entertainment world. I think it started in the 30s, but traditionally, black people weren't allowed to live in Manhattan and, you know, in the upper crust. So there are all these black jazz musicians and entertainers and whatnot that had all this money and then performing all the time in New York. And Queens was the closest place they could buy houses. Right. Okay. So they started in my neighborhood. So James Brown, Ella Fitzgerald. Cab Calloway, Jackie Robinson, um, um, Lena Horn, all of these people had houses in my neighborhood. Combining that with seeing Run DMC and LL Cool J just as people, like you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That made it that made it real to us. So their impact and their influence on us was crazy. And then when we got on, we went overseas for our, the first time. We went overseas. Run DMC. It was man. I was 17 years old. And it was Thanksgiving. We were in Germany. Wow. There's a first. It's the first time we had been away from home. You know what I'm saying? At Thanksgiving. And them dudes brought us a damn turkey. <laughs> oh, bless him. That's good. That's You know what I mean? Yeah. So That's... when you talk about Run DMC, like, yeah, they're super, super, super influenced. You know, yeah. super influenced. You talk about your neighborhood and you talk about, like, these guys influencing you. You've got tourists coming to see the street you grew up on now. Linden Boulevard, right there. Represent. Like, how's that sit with you now? Goosebumps, goosebumps, goosebumps. <laughs> mm, right? I can't even fathom that. I can't even fathom what that feels like. So it's it's insane, man. Like, um, 
Fife passed, and you know what I'm saying? I was like, yo, I, you know, that's the first thing I said. I said, yeah, I want a, a block. You know what I'm saying? Because it was in, it was in talks to name the block a tribe called Quest Way. But then after he passed, he was like, nah, we want it to be Fife Dog. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, they painted the mural. That was sick. They had a, a, a unveiling of the mural, which man, I can't tell you, thousands of people were there. And this is the and this is the very corner where we stood and hung out as young men and do what young men do. You know what I mean? Mm. And that's crazy to bring my son to see that. Bring my, bring my kids and have my kids take a picture in front of me. So it, it, it's crazy. Yes, yes, you are rocking with the best. This is the one and only Just Blaze. Right now you're checking out the Crate 808 podcast. Remember to hit up Crate808.com, like, comment, subscribe, and all of that. Peace. If you think about the generational thing then, because what were your parents like when you started this? Did you even have a conversation where you were like, by the way, I'm going to start doing this now. And obviously, you know, you have education in the mix. You have like work in the mix. Man, listen, my parents, my my family at first uh, wasn't about it because I was good in school. Uh, You know what I mean? I was in school. I, w- I went to Brooklyn Tech, which is a specialized high school in New York. It's like the number three rated school in all of New York City. Mm. Oh, wow. And I, and I, yeah, I went to that school. <laughs> damn, damn, okay. You know what I'm saying? So my, so my parents, you know, they were like doctor, scientist. You yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. But um, my dad, I can't front. My dad was always like, yo, at the end of the day, you got to always do what makes you happy. You know what I'm saying? That's big. That's big. He was like, yo, at, at, as always. You got to be comfortable with you and you got to make sure, you know what I'm saying, to make sure that. When you say that about your parents then, everything I gather from your career as, as, as an artist to a chef to a lot of other things you've done, you're kind of an outlier in rap. Like you don't lean on your tribe credentials too much. You've carved your own path outside of the music industry. That yeah. sense of individualism and the attitude that obviously helped tribe become tribe because obviously Q-Tip calls you the spirit of tribe – where did that individualism come from? Do you do you, can you can you pinpoint it? Uh, um, man, I, I just I think it's a, a case of nurture instead of nature. Like I had to be independent on my own um, because of my upbringing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my, my parents were divorced, um, so I lived between two households. You know, um, my dad in the Queens neighborhood that I was talking about. You know, it's uh, you know middle class existence you know what i'm saying i live like i live like a cosby show on that end i'm dead serious i'm dead serious but on the other end of the spectrum with my mom and it, it wasn't that it was a single mom situation and i felt myself having to um kind of float between those two existences and um i think i changed school a little more frequently than everybody in new york city did because everybody everybody had those six or seven years with this one group of people i, I never had that i never had that you know what I'm saying? Um, so I always floated. Yeah, I was always welcome in all these situations, but I kind of, I kind of walked that journey by myself. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Absolutely. And just look, just reflecting on your career, that makes utter sense. I can see now why you did what you, why your career has been your career. You know, when when you look at it, it's very, very easy to look at something and go, oh, to leave, to leave a, a project or something that is going to blow and you're in the process of it blowing and still have the fortitude to go, do you know what? This isn't going to make me as happy as this. I think there's something to that that's just really fascinating to me because it's not a situation I'll ever be in, but it's a life lesson or a life-like trait to just look at and go, wow, like, you know, that's pretty pretty amazing that someone can do that. At this point point in my life right now, bro, Mm -hmm. to be totally honest with you, um, I know... Some people look at me and my life and my story as a failure. And I, I laugh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I laugh. Like they, they question they question a lot of things. And they laugh. But I'm like, look, bro, pay attention. Look at me. Look what I'm, look what I'm doing. I'm staying true to myself. I'm having success in every facet I go into, bro. I'm not a, a bit player in any of these things. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And when you, you don't have to feel stuck. You can change. You can reinvent yourself. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to, the the end the end critic or judge is you. At the end of the day, it's you, man. Like all that other white noise is, is you know from unhappy people. And and that's the that is why native tongues. That's the native tongues identity. What you've just said there. Be yourself. Yeah. Be yes. yourself. And. 
growing up as a kid who who was looking for identity, I feel like I was in situations that weren't really maybe the most comfortable for myself, being in, in areas that are exclusively white and being a brown person. You know, those those were issues I didn't know I had to deal with. And then when you hear these things of of people just being like, oh, what? So they're wearing, they're not wearing gold, they're wearing those peace signs? That's odd. And then you have like the Beastie Boys where you're like, oh, wait a minute, what is this? And then, and then you, know, yeah. you pick all these things up and you're like, I just love the fact there was so much individualism in rap and hip hop in those nineties anyway, that, um, yeah. that, that, that still definitely comes through. Now, when you say people look at yourself and say, oh, you know, that's an example of a failure. I think the reason, the reasoning behind that is people, like you said, don't pay attention and don't read below the headline, bro. Yeah. Dig in. There's stories and you hear news and you hear stories of individuals. Unless you are invested in it, don't speak on it. As in, there's no yeah. need to speak on that unless you know. And then you can speak on it. Then you then you have an informed opinion. So those kind of things, I know for myself personally as well, like people look on, you, you can look at yourself and they're ready to hate, man. They're ready to hate, but you, there's a lot of love out there as well. And I hope this translates in that way, which is like, those people are those people. Like you said, it's white noise. We're here to talk about yourself and and like that aspect of, wow. Hey, man. Hey, man, the wolves care not what the sheep think. Yeah, that's <laughs> it, man. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, that's layers. There's layers to that one. I enjoyed that one. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we are then talking about Tribe and, and obviously your first like forays into music. Yeah. Man, when you and you guys are together and you're making music as Tribe, what was that first moment when you realised, oh, shit, we're actually quite good? Or like, like someone told, there's a validation of some sort. We tribe, the reason tribe is tribe is because all of these extraordinary circumstances, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm, yeah. Like, you know, my, my story, Fife has a story, you know, Fife was, Fife, Fife was a twin, but his twin brother died at birth. You know what I'm saying? There's a story there. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Kamal, man, I might write that book myself. <laughs> do, it, do it, do that. But um, like you know, what I'm saying so. So we all are super young kids. We start making demos when I'm 12. Uh, no, I'm no, I'm 13 in eighth grade. Okay. Cause it all went so fast. So that's when we started being in the music business. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? We had a lawyer. We had a manager. Studios that we preferred at fucking 13. I was 13. I'm in eighth grade, bro. Whoa. So Tip and we, uh, they go to high school. Tip goes and he goes to high school with fucking Africa, Sammy B from the Jungle Brothers, um, Brother J and Sugar Shaft from X Clan. Jesus, yeah. There was another kid. There was another kid in school who's like a senior. His name was Sir I Boo. He had a record out on radio. Like you know what I'm saying? It was it was it was crazy. So I went to high school with Milk D from Audio Two. <laughs> oh wow, you know that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Bismarck used to always come around our school and try to battle people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, biz. So this is really extraordinary circumstance. So we're going to the studio trying to cut our little demos. Meanwhile, Jungle Brothers pop off. Like I'm in the ninth grade. Yeah, they're in the 10th grade. That's when Jungle Brothers pop off. Uh, okay. So um, Mike G from Jungle Brothers, mm -hmm. his, uncle is, his uncle is Red Alert. Of course, yeah. So no, bro, we had instant access to the radio. That That is some circumstance that not everyone's going to fall into, right? That's amazing, Connects. Yeah, so they're already a groomed, polished act. So all of the things we're doing, we're learning under them. And we had a, a, a community. So we were just trying to impress our community, our 10 to 12 people. If it's fly to them, then it's fly. We weren't really even considering what the world is going to think about it. Now you have influencers. Now you have people like telling people, this is cool. This is cool. Rah, rah. But then it was like, do you know what? If my mates think it's cool, it's cool. That's that's it. That's fly. That's, that's amazing. It. That, that is the org organic, uh, what's the word? Foundation, the roots of it. If they're organic, then I think you're always going to be okay. If they're manufactured from jump, then it's going to be an uphill struggle to maintain, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, man. And I mean, we didn't even really consider the world. You know what I'm saying? Mm. The world. Because like, you know, hip hop, I, I, I try to relate this to people and not have them be offended. But if you're not a young black kid, really, and you listen to hip hop, you're kind of eavesdropping on a conversation. That's an interesting point. 
Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because we're talking to each other. It's a dialogue between two, but other people are hearing it. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not, when we, when I'm rapping, I'm not talking to the world, really. It's for the world to hear, I guess. But I'm talking to my boys, my people that I want, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But the conversation was so fascinating and enlightening that people took it, man. People took it and look what it is now. Yeah, that's what, you know, that's what hip hop is. And that's what we really considered it too. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it's no offense. I mean, of course, hip hop is for everybody and ah, ah, ah. But, you know, like when you think about it and when you when you comment about it and when you try to understand about it and try to talk about it, you have to understand the point of where you're on you're, you're, your point of understanding. So this is this this relates to something that I was having a chat with one, uh, a friend of mine, rap, rap fan, and he was saying that, um, oh, you know, it's just more dope and coke and gun talk. And that's been done 11 years ago about some, you know, Griselda and all these other people who are coming out. And I was like, but the thing is, really, that is that that is their life. Like, that's the conversation right. they're having. And you can either be invested in that conversation or you don't have to be. If you don't want to be, there's plenty of other stuff. But I feel mm-hmm. like what you've said there relates to it, which is this is a conversation. Yeah. This is a conversation about how we deal with life and the cards we are dealt with. And we are just spectators to it and invest in it on a fan point of view. So I I, I, I do really enjoy that that uh, take that you just said. I, I think there's something to that. Yeah, and, 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 and coming with that, man, you can't really uh, censor somebody's expression or the way they want to express themselves. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's, you know, you can, you can uh, feel some kind of way about it or have something to say about it or whatever, but you can't tell somebody not to do it. Absolutely. And that's the point. And that's the point, man. Yo, what up, y'all? This is DJ Premier, and you're checking out the Crates 808 podcast. I put an S on it because there's more than one record in the crate, you know what I'm saying? So that's how we dig, that's how we play, and that's what real DJs do. You heard? That's why it goes down. We out here. If we're, if we're going on to people's instinctive travels, man. Woo! Yeah, I, I didn't want to throw you right in the deep end. All right, we're going there. Okay, right, okay, yes, let's go. Uh, first of all, Ham and eggs, you're a chef. Is that something you actually still cook? Like, what? come on, ham and eggs. I, I fucking hate ham. I hate ham. It's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> I thought you did, because I think I read th- that you hated this. It's What's gross. It? It's gross. Ham and eggs also refers to um, working class people. Ham and eggers? Ham, I've, I've, no, never, never touched me, that, that, that term. Yeah. But if you're talking eggs, though, before we move into this album, top meal to do with eggs. Like, easy go-to meal with eggs. You've got six eggs. What are you making? Oh, me? I'm rocking an omelet off the rip. Oof, nice. Nice. Okay. And so, and so, like, you know, I'm a chef chef, so I make the classically fluffy, fluffy omelet, no brown. You know what I'm saying? Nice. Nice. Yeah. Feels like a cloud. When you're eating it, it feels like a cloud. Yes. I've, I've had those yes. eggs. Those eggs are on point. I like it. But then, dip it. no one's here to listen to about eggs, are they? They want to hear about the albums. Right, okay, sorry, people, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, that, that album, again, all these albums, Low End's my, that's my Desert Island Disc kind of album, Low End. People's Instinct Travel, all these are classics. Let's not forget, right, the intro to People's Instinct Travels. This <laughs> off-kilter birthing sequence, right? Or, or, or mm-hmm. what sounds like a birthday sequence? What yeah. made, what made you guys think? Oh, you know what? We're gonna kick that first album. We're gonna kick off with that. That's how we're gonna kick off with it. Well, it was the universe giving birth to our movement. You know what I'm saying? Nice, nice. That's what. That's what. That's why it's all starry sounding and a bit like you know what I'm saying. It's the universe giving birth. Okay, man. And then having the album come out obviously kills it. It gets five mics like in the source. The first album to get five mics. And you're selling hundreds and thousands. Like you haven't, it is no slow start to this. That You're kind of making an impact straight away. Yeah. How does that feel? Like as a young person who's also working in kitchens, I gather in 91, right? Uh, absolutely. Can you explain to someone like myself how that feels? Um, It was just, it's, it's crazy because like, like again, like, I, you know, I'm a pretty solitary person or whatever, but um, now people, now people know me. Like, before then, if somebody said my name and I don't know your face, like I'm ready to fight. I'm turning around, like you know what I'm saying, like yeah. yo, yeah. I'm about to swing, like you know what I'm saying. Call, call my name on the street and see what happens. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And now I have to I have to hold tone my whole thing down 
and be open to the possibility of talking to people and, 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 and indulging in whatever the fuck they want. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Whatever they want. So that was, that was, you know, a serious, uh, I didn't, I didn't, needless to say, I didn't get accustomed to it very quickly. The other, the other, the other boys took to it very well, especially q -tip. He loved it. You know what I'm saying? But me, you know, nah, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the way for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, all of this, you know, like now I have to carry myself and present myself for a unit. I'm not just responsible for myself. I'm responsible for the, how this unit looks. And this unit is way bigger than me. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's a movement. It's a movement. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, you have to, you know, I had to like, I just got my first piece of freedom and now y'all putting all these rules on me. <laughs> <laughs> It was. I was too immature. I was too immature to handle it. But it was dope going. Go, it was dope going around New York City, and I always felt it was different how our fans and the people who I only I don't like to call them fans. The, our follower, the people who rock with us, the our our people, our, the tribe heads are different to everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Because they don't look at us on a pedestal. They look like we're one of us. Like you know what I'm saying? Absolutely, hundred percent. Now that shit, that's the that that was dope. Like we would be with other famous people, like, oh my god, oh my god, such and such, oh, such and such, such. And they'd come up to us and be like, yo, man, I really felt such and such, man. Yo, I can't believe you know what I'm saying? Not like not like, oh my god, you guys are so cool, but they come and be like you actually speak about the music. Did you feel there was a difference then between yourselves and other acts? Like, so I know you you have a relationship with the ghetto boys, you have a relationship with Tupac when yeah. he was when he was young. Yeah, yeah. How you know all this shit? <laughs> the internet. You, are you not warning me? <laughs> <laughs> but I wish that boy, that boy's knowledge goes deep like a well. It's crazy. But th th this is the stuff that when I look at your relationship with certain acts and that runs like a thread in, in, in all your work, as in what you just said there, there's no whim we're up here and you guys are down here. Whereas when I do see acts like, and maybe I'm completely wrong here, but someone like LL blew up so big. It was really hard to relate to someone like LL Cool J when I was growing up. Yes. And, and wh whereas I can see you guys and, you know, I grew up a little bit later in the 90s, so I was stressed out, stuff like that was coming on. And, yeah. and I was feeling like, you know, I don't have to take my AK out today. For me, in my life, I get stressed. And that's the difference is there's a relatability to it that put you guys on a level with us and and, and as fans. And yeah, man, that, that came through. Um, but there's a few things I want to ask you as you just touched on there. Two things. One, the tribe logo, like how that came about. I need to know. And two, when you say uh, your name was called in the street, you're over, you're ready to fight. I'd love to know what, what's your name mean and where's it come from? Because I, I actually don't know that. Okay. Number one, tip hand drew that logo. Oh, snap. Really? Yeah, Tip hand drew that logo when I was like 16, That's 17. He was like, yo, what you think it is? I was like, holy fuck, that shit is dope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it, it lasts. I've got a hat now. I still wear to work with that logo because it's just timeless. It's great. Simple. Man, like, so yeah, because um, we didn't want to present ourselves like rappers. It would be limiting, like, you know what I mean? Like, also the name and all that stuff, all our rap names and everything, like, you know what I'm saying? We didn't really want to, um, we didn't want you to know. If you picked up a Tribe Called Quest album, you wasn't supposed to know what's hip-hop. Oh. Or no, or you wasn't supposed to know what it was. You're not supposed to be able to pick it up and be like, oh, oh, this is a rap album, this is a rock album, this is this album. Let's pick it up. Like, what the fuck is this? None of our artists traditionally, like, you know, mainstream hip-hop-ish, you know what I'm saying? And your name? Jerobi? <laughs> so, Jerobi is a place in Afghanistan. Oh. It's a, it's a valley near the Khyber Pass. That's mad. Okay. So my dad saw some documentary back in the days, and he was like, oh, I want to name my name Jerobi. <laughs> I want to name my son Jerobi. Wow. Wow. I'm glad, though, because my mom wants to name me Seymour, so I'm good. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'd have just love to see where Seymour would have landed in rap. There's not a lot of Seymours. Seymour. Oh, my God. That's the worst. What am I going to do? Just imagine. Just imagine the possibilities of a Seymour being, you know, absolutely hitting the big time. Amazing. I'm, I would have, I would have to been a hardcore rapper then. <laughs> yeah. There's no there's no other way. You'd have to. You'd have to. Uh, um, oh, before we move on to the other albums, uh, Lucian, man. I, I listened to the album again recently and I was like, wow, like, where is Lucian? Because he was part of Native Tongues, right? He was in that circle. Yeah. Lucian's still, Lucian still, Lucian still in Paris, man. Um, He's a Zulu Nation guy. He's still in Paris. 
Uh, last time we were in Europe, I spoke to him on the phone, like two years ago, last year, two years ago. Yeah, he's chilling. Lucien's good, man. Ah, cool, man. Cool. Just, that was an interesting character, and that is probably one of the best beats that we ever did. Oh, that that beat is sick. And you know what? It's got a following. I said it's so hard to. Yeah, it's got it's got a following. That track has got a following. There's been tribe fans I've talked to in the day, back in the day, and a lot of people do like that track, Lucian. And it's like, oh well, it, it is. It's a it's a wicked wicked track. That's yeah, yeah, hard. That's so hard. Yeah, definitely, man, definitely. But you know, you talked about the artwork there, and you talked about keeping it simple and and trying to mask who you were a little bit to the layman's eye, maybe or the. Art to low end theory is one of the most fascinating. So many questions have come out about that artwork and the woman who's on the artwork. Can you please break down for me where that came from and what it means? Okay. That lady is the voice of the narration of the tribe. That computer voice, that's the lady. That's her. That's her embodiment. That's her physical embodiment. So how did you guys come up with that idea and why a lady and why that art? Um, Chip always liked to deal, uh, stick with the narration type of thing between the records and stuff like that. Like in the first album, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was the start of the 90s. You know what I'm saying? So now we come from the 80s into the 90s and now it's, you know, things are getting computerized. We got cell phone now. You know what I'm saying? So we wanted to stay on the, on the, on the forefront and the cutting edge of those type of things, you know what I'm saying? And, and have a computer lady narrate the, narrate the shit and not physical. Body. That's, 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 uh, it's a, it, it works. It works so well to the point that didn't you get a model? Like, I think it was in, um, I was reading 2013, you were doing a stage show and, uh, there's a model came out wearing red, black and green body paint at the same time. <laughs> and you did like bunny tackle bum or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whose idea was that? That was Tip's idea to have somebody like a live lady painted. Oh, that was so that was dope. I'm like reliving it in my mind. Now. Yeah, that was that was a dope idea. We was like, yo, what if we brought her to life? Because we had to do something weird. We was like, yeah, let's bring her to life during Bonita. Have her out. And the the girl's name is Stephanie Santiago. Fine that stuff. She's a, a, a good friend of mine. Really, really good girl. And we were looking, we were looking, look. So they gave us a book full of models. <laughs> <laughs> It was a book full of models to look through and pick one out who you want. You know what I'm saying? Pick your top three. And that's, I was like, oh, Steph, all day. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, and she's nice. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, and she's fine, and she's nice. I'm like, yo, that boom, right off the rip. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and it was like, word, word, word. Hey, yo, 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 this is your boy, Farrell March. And right now, you are rocking live with the Crate 808 Podcast. Enjoy this week's episode, and just remember to subscribe and rate and review. Peace. Hey, if we're looking at the album, there's a few of the things I want to talk about on Low End Theory. There was the, uh, I mean, I've heard there was a lot of verses cut of yourself that's supposed to be on that album. I also heard, like, uh-huh. Scenario. Were there, like, different versions of Scenario? Like, were you on a version oh, of Scenario? I think, I think, I think there were about... Eight or nine versions, bro. <laughs> Whoa, eight or nine. Are you guys waiting for like an ultimate box set to drop this? Because nine versions of scenario, I'm ready. No, there are some of them are just so fucking convoluted. Just that like everybody who heard that big one to rap on it. And we indulge, but we picked the, the best version of it. Did you have a verse on that? Did you have a verse on that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, man. Oh, that... two versions. There's two versions. There's two versions that I have a verse on. And it's me and Buster going back and forth. Oh, <laughs> Jerovi, man, that is going back and forth with Buster as well. What a task! Fair play to you, man, stepping onto that plate. I don't think I would have. He said he said some shit, and he would. I would reply to it, and he's like, you know, what I'm saying it was funny. Oh man, that's sick. His energy's yeah, ridiculous, ridiculous. I love that, yo. That's my little brother. I love that too. On I remember any really of tribe? I think I, I, I would. I would say that. Oh no question. So <laughs> during the making of Low End Theory. I was staying with my mom or in uh, Hampstead, Long Island, and um, he lived on in the next town, Uniondale. Yeah, I would take him. I would take him to all the clubs and shit, and all of the um, all our studio sessions or whatever. He would always try to be there. He would call Tip, and if he couldn't find Tip, he would call Five. And if he couldn't call Five, he would <laughs> find me because like, he would just pull up to my house. I'm like, come on, I'm in the studio. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so yeah, he was always trying to be around. Like, you know what I'm saying? That was dope. That is dope, and obviously. Turned up in them videos, turned up all that. Talking about videos, though, check the rhyme, right? Classic video. Yeah, yeah. Health and safety, guys. As in, you guys are on top of cleaners, right? No fencing, 
No, nothing. Yeah, oh, that shit was hot too. It was the hottest day of the summer. And, you know, they had the asphalt roof. Oh. It was burning hot up there. Jeez. We had to climb a ladder to get up there. We was like, well, we, want, we want to do something in our neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? With, you know, the classic neighborhood video. And we was like, yo, we should do it on top of the cleaners because that's the corner we stood on. You know what I'm saying? Of course. And we should yeah. do it on top of the cleaners. That would be nuts. And have downstairs like we performing on top of the cleaners. He was like, yo, that's nuts. And we pulled it off and that was crazy. That was sick, man. And no one fell off. Great. Perfect. Nobody, nobody fell off. Nobody fell off. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. great. Even better. <laughs> that would have shut the whole operation down early, dude. <laughs> oh, man. Trust me, man. Trust me. Imagine. No way. But it, it, again, sorry I touched on this before, but I, I do need to dive back because uh, we talked about your relationship with uh, Scarface, Bushwick Bill and, and Tupac and stuff like that. Could you tell me, especially for people who got into Tupac maybe a bit later, can you tell me when you were there at the early stages, what did those kind of artists bring to rap that other people hadn't done at that point? Oh, man. So I'm the first time I met Brad and um, and Bushwick Bill, it, man, it was like our, our first run, our first jive run, like one of those promotion runs or something like that. And we were going down south and they would always like hip hop was different back then. When you did a hip hop show, um, they would have maybe a national artist or whatever but they would always pair them with somebody regional and stuff like that. So you have a variety of on the show, you know what I'm saying? So we were always somebody local and stuff like that. And they were big, they were huge. They were huge in Houston. And we were getting big too. So that was like a big show. And, you know, I got to um, hang and chill with those guys. And um, the Ghetto Boys, they were the f- first out of Houston, like the first regional, you know, super huge regional act. And their storytelling style, the darkness, like the darkness in their music, it was just a different, it was a different, that, that psychotic rap. I think that was the birth of that psycho yeah. rap. Yeah, that, 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 was their, that was their influence. You know what I'm saying? And Pac, when I met Pac, we, you know, same thing. It was a show with like Tribe Called Quest, Digital Underground, Queen Latifah, Third Base. Oh, we was on a little tour. We was sucked. on the tour. Yeah. And man, man, that was fun. That tour was a lot of fun. And back then, he was just like the dancer, Rody. Not just, he was a dancer, Rody. And then he would come out during the same song and blow the shit off. And then, you know what I mean? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it, was, it was dope to see. You know what I'm saying? Digital Underground, they were like the hip hop band. They were like funk. They were like deep, deep, deep into the funk, like George Clinton's sons. You know what I'm saying? And they brought that, that, that angle to the music. You know what I'm saying? Because we just dabbled in all those things and made our, our reflection, but using all those elements. But they were really in, in there. Where was where was Pac's head at at that time? Because I know he had a very militant side to him early doors. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> when I first met Pac, I can't remember him saying nigger oh, at wow. all. Like you, know, like you know what I'm saying? You know, um, he was he wasn't as gangster, quote unquote, as he turned out to be in later life. Hey. Oh. If we're tripping back, if we're going back to the albums, Midnight Marauders, man, Midnight Marauders. Mm-hmm. Again, the run you're on here, by the way, as a team, it must have felt a bit like, oh, we can't really do anything wrong because you're like smashing it. Every time you drop something, it's kind of kind of a classic. Like you can look back and go, there are three classics. Well, okay, so the first album, People's Distinctions, was us presenting our, our style and fashion, the way we do things and how we do shit. You know what I'm saying? Our vibe. Um, the second album, was the introduction of Fife Dog. You know what I'm saying? So there was kind of a, always a, a one-up thing each time. The third album is like Jordan in his sixth, seventh year. You know what I'm saying? Damn. That's how we felt. Like, you know what I'm saying? We um, And first album, it was successful. People were talking about, oh, they're going to have the sophomore jinx. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? And we just slammed that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And now, going into the third album, we know what we're doing now. You know what I'm saying? We know how to use the tools now. So it was, yeah, so that was the apex of, you know, 30-year-old basketball player, 25-year-old running back when they're in their prime, where the intelligence meets the physical perfection. That's where we were at that point. Yeah, and you can tell. There's a, not a swagger, but you know what I mean? Like a strut, like, yeah, man. No, it was swagger. It was swag. It was swag. <laughs> it was swagger. It was swagger. Let's not lie. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, but 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 with with... To your credit, as in, like, yeah, you should be. You just absolutely killed it. So it's nice to feel that and see that. Even the ambition on the stuff like the cover, like having all those people on that. Like, whose idea was that? Like the cover for Moon Up Marauders. Um, tip, of course, again, 
it was uh, the culmination on being those two journeys and the people that we had picked up and the, and the tribe getting bigger. The tribe growing. The tribe is growing now. So it has to be even represented like that. Yeah. And um, I think that comes together quite nicely on that album, that there's a uh, harmony that maybe can't be found in later albums. When you look at stuff like uh, the Love Movement, to be fair, the We Got It From Here album is one of my favourites for the last 10 years, easily. It's incredible to see artists still having that ability to really just make my neck break and also just keep going back, just keep going back to the album, man. The journey towards that album, what was that journey like for you, for yourself? I've heard the story to Tip and, and obviously with Fife, but for yourself, how was that journey towards making that last album? Oh, my God. Whoa. Oh, man. So, um, 25th anniversary of the first album came around and we did a promo run for that. And we had a lot of things surrounding that. Like we had the Vans Shoes collaboration, radio interviews and all that stuff and press and all that stuff. And that was the first time we had been together in a ring for years. Wow. First time we've been for years. And it went all of the stuff from the past or whatever, all that shit was irrelevant. You know what I'm saying? So going into that last, we did that last run. And then we did the um, Jimmy Fallon show. And that was the first time we had performed in years. And we didn't even practice. Wow. <laughs> wow. That is crazy, man. We just discussed which songs we were going to do. That was the only discussion that we, you know what I'm saying? And this isn't even like a club in New York somewhere. You're on the Fallon show. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. That's how insane... Well, that's how in the vibe, in the moment, in the thing we are. It's not about what we're doing. It's about this circle right here. What what are we? What are we doing? Because we know when we're clicking on all cylinders, it's nothing really, nothing really like it. So we do that show. It goes fantastic. We all feel alive, like you know what I'm saying. Like we never felt in years. We're like, oh my god, dude! Can you believe we just did that, dude? Oh my god! Like this is just us grown ass men, like. You know, done this point. Oh my god! And, yo, we murdered that, yo. I'm like, wow. I'm like, well, we feel bad for anybody who does the show anymore. Shoot, we got to top that. Like, you know what I'm saying? And Jimmy Fallon, came out, oh my god! Like, you know what I'm saying? And it was, it was a thing. They were like, yo, how long was y'all practicing? Like, you know what I'm saying? We were laughing. So, um, so me and Tip are driving back, and I'm like, yo, that was nuts, wasn't it? He was like, yo, that was crazy. I was like, yo. We still got some left, man. And he's like, I can't even lie to you. Yo, man, yeah. And then the conversation started. And then it was just it was just like me and Tip was like, okay, fuck it. This is what we're gonna do. We're just gonna start making beats. And whatever happens, happens. You know what I'm saying? We're just gonna start making beats. That's what we started start making beats. And then um everybody got on board. You know what I'm saying? And um he was like, Yo, you pestered me about this. Like this was this was a huge moment in my de- in my development as a in my, in my, as a human being. You know what I'm saying? Because like you said, I've always gone back and forth. I was never really like, you know, so I was on the periphery. And this time he was like, Yo, you fucking brought us and made us do this. You pestered us to do this. Because I'm a little brother, like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I'm the youngest, so yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, um, I was always insulated by those guys, all of those things. You know what I'm saying? I never had to really bear the burden of that tribe shit as much as they had to. And this time, Tip, the fucking genius, beautiful dude he is, he put me in charge. Damn. Damn. This album is the most involvement I've had. Wow. And you've done a lot, though, in the others. You have done no, no, a no, no, lot. No, 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 no. Hear me out. Hear me out. Like, yeah, I've always been there through the music making process with him. Oh, and that was always just a thing. Me being like, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't know my vibe. You know what I'm saying? My, the, you know, how those guys feel about me, the vibe. I make them happy. So, um, yeah, I've been there and stuff like that. But, like, the, the amount of writing and contributing to song ideas and stuff like that that I did this time around is way, is way more. That's great. There's at least four or five songs in the album that start with my thoughts. You know what I'm saying? And that was a big thing. And they also made me deal with the industry people, record label people. And that was, that was different. That was something I was so insulated from all the time. You know what I'm saying? And the part of me um, sticking it out and, and completing it and all that stuff, that was very essential to my development as a human right now. That's done so much for my, like my, all of the people that know me will tell you that something happened. Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was, so that's, yeah, it's a lot. That's a beautiful thing, man. To know you've been doing this for however long, 
You've gone off on different paths. You've had a family. You got married at Dave Chappelle's house. Like, let's take that over for a second. You've done all that. And at this age, it's inspiring to me, who's someone who's about to hit 40, that you can still do your best stuff. Or not, not it might not be your best stuff, but stuff that has has changed, as you said, it changed you. And 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 that is is an inspirational thing, man. When you say to me about this album, we got it from here. Thank you for your service. I I, I adore this album. I can't figure out what that title means, though. Like what it was supposed to be. I know what it means to me, but could you explain that title to me? What it what it meant to you when you wrote it down? Well, um, it was it was a saying that we saw all together, and Fife was like Fife was like that should be the name of the album. We got it from here. Thank you for your service. Because we knew this is the last one. Like, you know what I'm saying? This, 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 is, this is it. Like, you, I know we, fuck around, we fucked around with, like, this being it for, <laughs> for 20 years. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, this is it, it for Tribe. Like, like this, like, this is the last clip in the chamber. So it's very, it's, it's very fitting. And I can speculate that fi- it had deeper meaning for Fife than us. You know what I'm saying? But, um, you know, I'm just speculating. I'm just speculating. But I know my boy. You know your boys, though. That's it, exactly. Better than most. So, I mean, that verse on Lost Somebody is just, there's so much heart to that verse. When you when you were writing that, and, and even even when you were working on this album generally, how was Fife? Was he, like, up for it? Was he like, yes, let's smash this? How was he? So, um, this is very personal. I don't know if I should be. Fuck it, man. I, I've never talked. So, this is, um, uh... So, like I said, me and Chip started doing beats, and uh, Chip is a genius. So I, you know, I just kind of listen to him. You know what I'm saying? For sure, for sure. <laughs> because he's proven himself to me. So um, he was like, uh, "I'm not writing on this album. It's just gonna be your guys rhyming." Wow, <laughs> what? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about left hand turns. There's a certain formula look, that works. I look, yo, my dude. I look back on all of this shit, and I'm just, it's just. It's, 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 man, it's crazy. Um, so that's how it started. So I started writing songs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I started writing songs and I was worried about where Fife was going to be lyrically. I was, um, not lyrically. No, no, that's, that's the lie. Not lyrically, but like sty- stylistic. I was wondering if, is he's going to be comfortable or is he going to jump on this ledge with me? Right. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, um, I wrote um, the lion's share of uh, this generation. What a song! And um, that's where it started. And then five, you know, five said them shits and put us those shits. And then he just bow got in like, <laughs> like bow got into it. And it's like oh, oh, you're moving me now. Oh, okay, let's go. You know what I'm saying? And he just yeah. started. He started blacking the fuck out. Bang. You know what I'm saying? And it, just, and it was just me and this and this dude fucking blacking out on the shit. And then Tip was like, okay, I'm jumping in. <laughs> you know, and then, that, you know, and that, was, and that was it. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, you know, I, um, oh, yeah, crazy. That's bad. It's, it's, it is that element of when Fife goes in, he goes in, bro. Like his, in, his, in, he goes in. He goes in. Like his solo stuff as well. Like the stuff he did with Dilla, man. Um, but Dilla is. Like, yeah, I can't tell you how much that boy has changed my life, like growing up. But like, obviously, there there was a there was a resurgence in Dilla when he'd done his thing. Did you did you ever work with Dilla? Did you see Dilla work with Fife when he was doing his stuff with him? Man, you don't think that I was with Fife doing his whole? I know show you shit? were, Jerovi, man. I'm you leading don't think you into I was this with question. Him all of studio sessions. Come on now, <laughs> you know you know better than that. You know I better. do, I do, I do. I had to get you in there though. Yeah. So uh, here's a here's a great story about that so um our first last tour our first last album last tour the beastie boys tour in the turn of the century me and fife ducked off the tour we stayed in detroit we did a show in detroit we all hung out me and fife stayed in detroit though because fife wanted to do some songs so we spent the extra two days with dilla in detroit with dilla and frank frank, frank nick uh, you know, so we spent the extra two days with them we did some beats or whatever and that was just normal. That was just normal. So yeah, we uh, we hung out, you know, a lot and did a lot of stuff. Fife did a lot of stuff for Dilla before everybody was doing it. Like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Fife did a lot of stuff. There's a lot of Fife and Dilla songs in the can. Oh, what in the can? What ready to go? Come on, 
Don't tell me that. That's <laughs> anything new with Diller, and, and then you put five on there as well. Then yeah, I, I mean, man, yeah, there's, there's, there might be, there might be a, a five album somewhere. Oh man, yeah, it's it's a tough <laughs> one. It's a, it's a tough <laughs> one when when the person himself isn't here, and you and you feel like there's a legacy, and I always feel a bit like. I don't know. Do do you want to build on it, or do you want to? I don't know. As a fan, I'm always a little bit. But then, I'm not going to lie to you. I was wary when I knew you guys were dropping this album. I know y'all was. So, so let me ask you some questions. So when you, heard, I'm being honest. So you have to be honest too. Mm-hmm. When you heard that an album was almost to completion, from Tribe, and they were putting it out, what was your what was your thoughts? There was a, there was an existential dread. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I ain't going to lie. Like there's. There's a purity. This is why we do a 90s rap podcast, because there's a purity to what formed my childhood, right? Yeah. If that's like a glass of milk, and then you drop a bit of ink in it, it could potentially mar the purity. So as as a hip-hop fan of all, all, all stuff, from loving Death Row Records as a kid, to then going into my noughties, going into the noughties and being in my 20s, and hearing Death Row artists do stuff that didn't move me, it really affected my love for... The 90s music. Now I'm almost 40. It's not that anymore. Now I can appreciate it again. So when I heard you guys were dropping something, initially it was a dread. But then I was thinking, I trust people like Q-Tip. And after seeing the documentary itself, I also wanted to see where you guys were just as a group. As in, when I knew, when you see the track list and you see who's on it, the fact you're putting Kendrick on there, the fact you're putting Joey Badass on there, you're putting you're putting people on there and you're mixing it, then it kind of really developed into a kind of hope. And it was like a, wow, like they, they might be doing things the right way, maybe. And then, mate, soon as by the second, third track, I was, yeah, it was just like, this is possibly the best thing a 90s group has done since the 90s. As in, that's how high I hold the album. Because... Show me a list of five other acts who've done as good albums as they've done the nineties, and it, you know it's hard to compile that list. No, nobody has had a nineteen twenty year absence from music and come back and come back with a number one album. That has never happened before. Exactly. Look it up. Yeah, Pink Floyd, anyone, Michael Jackson, anyone. No one's done that. Do you know what I mean? It's it's insane. Yeah, man. But uh, you know what? I, I, here's another thing that I tell people though, like. Um, People come up to me like, yo, Jerobi, oh my God, you're spinning. What the fuck, dude? Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And like, yo, to be honest with you, I, can, I cannot, I'm not going to take credit for that. I'm a vessel. You know what I'm saying? I'm a vessel for something else. You know what I'm saying? Because if we're going to be honest, honest, I don't have a rhyme. I don't own a rhyme book. Oh, wow. I don't write rhymes every day like that. I don't do that. You know what I'm saying? When you put a beat on and it moves me, you know, when you first, when you first hear a beat, you're like, oh my God, I write in that feeling. That's fascinating. Because I just assume that as as rappers and people to, you know, like you just want to express yourself, like just just get 10 minutes out of yourself. And for yourself, it might be cooking a dish. I would assume that you'd be just writing something just to creatively do, just for yourself and close the book, put it in the drawer and you've done something. Do you know what I mean? But, but you, just, you just vibed off the track. Yeah, that for me. For me. Now, other people I know, I see rappers, they got mad rhymes and stuff like that, but that's one for me. And Tip is like that. Too. And Tip is like that too. You know what I'm saying? He writes. It's kind of like it's in a moment, like you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I don't want to think about it. I want to be, I didn't want me to spit on this album and think about it too much because there's a lot of things that could jam me up in my process in trying to rap on the album. But then but then you say that, like, cause cause the album, there's a there's loss on there, there's a lot of political commentary, there's a lot of you shift your gaze inwards and outwards in the album, which is a beautiful thing. Um your verse then on killing season. You say that you didn't want to think too much about it and just go on with it. That that verse, four years later, when, when you look back at that verse, there's a lot of truth in that verse that is even more evident today. How do you feel looking back on something like those lyrics then that you may not have want to think about too much, but they resonate more today than any time, especially America? Well, firstly, I'm extremely, extremely happy and smiling and proud because that's one of my babies. I, I mean, obviously, that's my song. That's my song. Um, to play the beat, and I was like, "Oh my god, I got something for this." I wrote that one. Oh wow! I wrote that. Um, and I, oh god, this is so fucked up because I can't even remember which black kid got killed at the time when I wrote it. That is fucked. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But I was in tears on my steps writing that song. Damn, it comes through, man. There's an emotion to that. There's an emotion to the other one about with Fife as well. And 
that takes a lot. It must take a lot. It takes a lot for you to do anything in this world, like to to, 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 to any creative project you put yourself in, fair. Some people put themselves in about 60, 70%, and that's fine. That's good. That's all good. You know, artists who want to sell records, probably less. But you're putting your you're putting a lot into that. And I feel like um that slept Ooh. on sometimes. I think that slept on. I, that like I said for me, that album was I was letting go of a lot. It was for my mental state. That whole process, my, my the writing of it and everything, like yeah, it, it does look outward and inward because that's what I was what I was going through on that help. Like I was going through, this. yeah, yeah. Hey, yo, what up, y'all? This is Prince Paul, and you're rocking with Crate 808 Podcast. Now, I want you to enjoy this week's episode, and just remember to subscribe and rate and review. All right? Peace. So, Joy of you, man, what, we talked about all the music, but I know you're a fan of the actual music and culture. You're you're part of it. You're all one. You're not, you're not like, we're here, they're there kind of thing. No, no, yeah. So, as a fan... I thought I'd ask you a few questions about 90s hip hop and just, you know, get your take on them, right? 90s track you wished you could have featured on and why? Ooh, um, the Crooklyn Dodgers remix. Yo, with Chub Rock? Yeah. Yo, I, yo, he is one of the most underappreciated MCs on the planet. His, his breath control, his command, his his lyrical dexterity, his vocabulary, he's just another, on another fucking planet, dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I would have loved to rock on that shit. Uh, yeah. 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 I would, yeah. 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 I would have rocked on that shit. Question. And I would have, I, I would have rapped on, um, um, Le Flo and Le Fla Escoshka by Bukhan Oh, Bukhan Yes. Yes. Yo. Of course. Of course. Bukhan 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 be the best, yo. Uh, slam from East to West. Yeah. I would have rocked Nice. Nice, man. Good choices. Definitely. People out there, go listen to them, man. Um, if we're looking at 90s, 90s artists that has aged the best for you. Oh. Um, Wu Tang definitely nice. Um, well, you can say Outcast is nineties, right? Yeah, Outcast nineties. Yeah, D- their music's it's still fresh today. Like you just crack the rapper off of it. Um, Doom, I love it. Yes, Doom is it's just it's timeless. It's timeless, bro. And he just keeps dropping good stuff. I mean, maybe not recently, but if you just look at his career as a whole, there's a run there that is pretty unrivaled. Yeah, when you look at 90s artists who are aging the best. That's 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 kind of well. For instance, when Q-Tip just recently said he was going to do like uh, three new albums, yeah, that is something where I would be like, I'm very interested to see where he is musically right now. <laughs> you know I'm fishing here, right? You know I'm fishing. You know I'm fishing. I can't fishing. wait. Listen, listen, listen. Come I on. can't wait. I can't wait for y'all to hear that shit. Yeah. Have you heard some? Have you heard some of it? No, I haven't heard any. Okay. Of okay. course. <laughs> I didn't know which way you were gonna go, man. Are no, gonna... these are my friends. No, like he's my friend. Like you know what I'm saying. Like you know what I'm saying. Like take the music. So this is, I think, the reason why Tribe is a little different than a lot of other groups. Like we were all, we all grew up together, and Tribe isn't the crux of our relationship. It's like if we all went to work at Sears. So like we're family. Like we're, we're you know we're friends with family. So yeah, and his shit. I can't wait until it comes out. He got he, he's just features in his own. He's in his own right. Now. But that's the thing, isn't this another thing about the this culture that we are we love and we are born in this whole culture, right? When you look at um people like him, people like Primo, people like DJ Muggs, people like Madlib. When you listen to these people now, it does they don't they're not aging. Q Tip did stuff on Danny Brown's album, and he did stuff on. Bro, 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 bro! Listen to me, listen, man. Any other art form, you're 20 years in, you're a virtuoso. Mm. We're virtuosos now, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Of course, everything we do is good. Like the this ageism thing in hip hop is. Yeah, it's bullshit, it's, right? It's, it's befuddling to me. It's bullshit. It's it's a it's a thing that um yeah I don't pay much attention to, but I just love the fact that people can grow artistically and and still. You know why? You know why? Go. Hip hop is the most powerful art form in the world. They don't want a bunch of me's out there talking about how I feel about shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah, we will crumble shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, that's why hip hop, you know, it's just the ageist thing. And I would, I, I'm saying that out loud because I want people to to to, to understand that for sure, man, for sure. And especially especially the young dudes because I get it because when I was. 1920, I was invincible too. You know what I mean? Oh, hit, oh, hit. I'm like, yo, dummy. Hopefully, you get to be my age. That's <laughs> I'm like, it. What are you doing? Like, what are you 
are you talking about? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? And I think that another thing is younger, younger generation isn't as invested in hip hop as a culture and an art form as we are because we had to we had to build it. You know what I'm saying? We had to build it. It wasn't there before. And it was it was something that was ours that we could take credit for and be like, yo, we helped build this. You know what I'm saying? And they're coming into it, you know, reaping the benefits and enjoying it. That's what we did it for for them to do it. But just you have to know your history though, with anything. Yeah. Just pretty you have to know your history. Like if I if you were a basketball player, aren't you gonna watch old Michael Jordan footage? Yeah. And I, I <laughs> That's just my take on it. No, but no, a fair take, a fair take for sure, man. Joby, then, if we talk about artists, every every time someone comes on, I put them in this situation, and you can curse me out if you want to. But I would love to know your top five. Obviously, this will change at some point. Top five MCs. Oof. Um, top five MCs. Um, ah, uh, favorite or who I think are the best. Because that's you know that's different. I, I would go favorite because they're more interesting to me. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, Doom, Ghostface, Karis One, uh, LL, LL. Okay, and Biggie. Oh, Biggie, Biggie, nice, nice. There's uh, we I, I, those people, those people. I consider myself a um, uh, if I was to describe myself, that's how I would say I would describe myself. That's an interesting way. You're made up of those. Let me, yeah, let me just reflect on that for a second. That's, you've got the humor, definitely. Biggie humor, there we go. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's an interesting way because it builds a picture of, of obviously your taste, but also who you are. I, you know, I have the, I have the nerdy street shit like Doom and, and, and Ghostface. Stylistically, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I try to be a little complex and I try to uh, show my intellect like Harris One and teach. And I write every rhyme like I'm Biggie. <laughs> so there's this formula that I notice in rap and shit. Because I'm a nerd. There's this formula in rap and shit. Like the big songs, it's like you introduce yourself, you say your name. You say how good you are, how fly you are. Then you say how much the bitch is like you. <laughs> and then you go in to prove it by how nice you are with the rest of the rhymes. That is, yep. Yeah. You've nailed it. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's it, right? Yeah. Don't tell everyone that. That, 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 that. Not everyone knows, man. I don't think. Man, if I can make everybody better MCs, please do it. Yeah. True. 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 Good point. Some of you dudes are trash out here. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I feel you. I feel you, man. If we're having a bit more fun, then before we do leave, if you could have been a fly on the wall on any studio session in the '90s, which one and why? Um. Either like the Wu Tang Clan sessions. Or that fucking NWA Dr. Dre sessions. Oh, those would have been hectic. Both of them would have been hectic. I'd have yeah, loved, buddy. I'd have loved to be with yeah. Rizzo in that stairwell, that elevator shaft, just banging that drum. Do you know? <laughs> like, yeah. they was like, what is going on right now? Do you know you mentioned Wu, right? You mentioned Wu. Mm-hmm. There is one thing I didn't want to ask. Um, we ask everyone, because we have a little Spotify playlist of um, hidden, slept on Wu-Tang bangers. So like, because they've had so much stuff out, especially on their solo stuff. There's tracks that everyone loves, but nobody talks about a lot of the tracks. Is there any that you think, you know what, they need to be dis- like discovered more or talked about more? Yeah. Um, Rawhide off of, uh, Return 36 Chambers, Old Dirty Bastard. Huge. Man, I love that damn song. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Do people talk about Winter Wars? Oh, yeah, man. Kappa. Yes. Uh, but still, a shout out for Winter Wars always. It's never out of place. Sheesh. So. <laughs> Sheesh. Um, let me see. They're probably gonna be all old dirty bastard songs because I'm just I'm man. I should have put him up there too. I should have put him up there too. I'm just such an old dirty bastard fan. Yeah, just like his whole freaking album, the whole nigga please album. Nobody fucks with that shit, but I love that shit. Damn, yeah, man. His influence is still looms large as well, man. Still looms large. Yeah, definitely. Well, Lim, okay, gonna jump onto a few list of questions before we wrap up, man. We got Shoot. Rob Percy out there. Which tribe album is the true definition of the group? Mm. I would have to say this last one, to be honest with you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I would have to say this last one. Us coming, us coming back together and doing what we're doing just for the sake of it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because we said, if this shit is whack, we're not putting it out. But we would have spent that time together. So it wouldn't, there's, no lo- there's no losing in the situation. That was the attitude going in. So I would say that that totally embodies our spirit. But then, like, you know, number, number three is like, you know, I'd say that one too, you know? That sense of camaraderie was definitely there for that. And I don't know why it was, but there was something in... Uh, love movement and stuff like that. That I don't know. There was just I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's because you read all these stories and you imprint that on there. But I don't know. W- w- with this last one, there's a sense of that camaraderie that's absolutely yeah sewed it all together. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Lee Can, who's also helped me a lot with this research, so big up, brat, brat. Uh, he says, there's an episode of Pharrell Williams, right? Uh, Beats One Radio. He's interviewing Q-Tip. And Q-Tip plays Jungle Brothers, uh, JB's Coming Through, right? Banger. Absolute mm. banger. Mm. Uh, mm. Q-Tip says on that interview that that is one of the top three best arranged hip-hop records of all time. So... This listener obviously wants to know, have you ever heard from Tip? What are the other two best arranged hip-hop records? Has he sent them to you? Mm, no. Oh, no. I think that he really wanted to know what they could have been. <laughs> He's got another one, though, for you. Uh, I think I know the answer, but let's go in. Will there ever be an actual Native Tongues album? Nah, man. No? He's even nah, written a piece here. He's written, you want to hear the piece? This is from a fan. Mm-hmm. Jerobi, it can still happen. Now's the perfect time with this lockdown to start the conversation. <laughs> Let's do some beats, <laughs> trade some verses, get De La Soul, Latifah, Jungle Brothers. They're all at home, Black Sheep, everyone. And let's do it. Merch. He's here to help you, he says, with the merch and the tour <laughs> and the Broadway play. I'm sure. I'm so sure. <laughs> I'm so sure. Um, nah, it's not going to happen. Oh, man. Yeah, fair. fair. I think I knew that. There's a, couple, there's, a couple, there's a couple of people within us that can't be in a room together. Absolutely, man. I thought I knew the answer, but you know what it is with rap fans as well? It's funny to just imagine the what ifs, I think, sometimes. And I think that's, especially with you guys, there's a fun aspect to your music that really drives that conversation. Do you know what I mean? So, man, man, I, I am, you know, sometimes I, I, I'm kind of disappointed about that native tongue situation. That it, there's so much more that could have been done with what we were planning to do. It was so much we were planning to do, man. It was, you have no idea, <laughs> mate. What we're, what we're gonna, what we're gonna do? We were gonna have, we were gonna have project with, with all of us together. Projects with some of the members of some groups and some of the members of other groups, different formulations. Like you know what I'm saying? It was gonna be, it was about to be nuts, but like egos, man, egos. Yeah, it happens, man. It happens. You hear it a lot, uh, and there's a lot of you. I think just that alone, there's just a lot of people in that. I even remember when uh, did Andre say there was supposed to be like Andre Three Thousand was saying something about like a collaborative like was it um, a tri called cast? And I remember at that point thinking that's a lot of people involved in that 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 you know want to have a voice. It'd be interesting to see how that would happen. That would have been easy. That would been easy because we're friends. There you go. That would have been, that'd been easy. We're friends. The, the groups the groups mirror each other. Hey guys, this is Jerobi from A Tribe Called Quest, and you're listening to The Crate 808 Podcast. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this episode with me. And remember, Crate808.com. Go check it out. Peace. If, if we just quickly, though, I need to, because I haven't, I, I know we've got bogged down in the actual culture and all that, but I don't want to not talk about your chef and cooking, and because I think there's similarities between feeling good when you eat something and feeling good when you hear music. And I remember the stories of of you helping Fife eat better when, when, when you know, yeah. he was ill. Are there yeah. similarities you see between being a chef and, and the rap game? Yeah, first one you just mentioned, spot, spot the fuck on. Um, the, the instant gratification thing, you know what I'm saying? As a chef, as a musician, I, you know, when I play my shit and start bobbing your head, I know you like it. When you put that first fork in your mouth, you're like, mm, I know you like it. <laughs> And also, like, you're only as good as your last record. You're only as good as your last dish. You know what I'm saying? If you fuck up, just make another one real quick. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can fix it. Make another one. Fix it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, running a kitchen is, is very, like, symphonic. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's definitely like being a fucking director. Ah. Like, you know, it's like, okay, mute those drums now. Bring up, this, bring up the cymbals. That horn needs 50. But like, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, okay, cool. All right. Come with the salad. Okay, hold off on that meat. Give me those vegetables right quick. Now give me the meat. And that's and like now, it's like now we the new rock stars now too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That, yeah, that's it's crazy. I'm waiting for that book, man. I'm waiting for the book in the series. We're just waiting over here, man. So Well, it's the series is the book. Oh man, I just, you know what? I'm gonna be honest with you. I just have a problem transcribing all this shit, man. I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I can't like there's a lot of stuff that I had never measured before. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I have to sit and I have to sit there and and measure it until it's like to my taste. But I have to really keep like, man, I'm not I'm not looking forward to doing that. <laughs> but it's that way. That's the that's the thing, right? <laughs> There's a sense of cooking and music working together. Like when you say you don't measure anything. So we I grew up in an Indian household. There was no measuring. There's no measuring. It's just put it There's in. There's no measuring. Yeah, just put it until it tastes good. 
But come 20 years later, me, a student, trying to make my mum's curry, this ain't happening, man. Like, what is going on? Yeah, so good there's, luck, good luck. yeah, exactly. But there's this passed on knowledge thing that I think you get in rap and you also get in cooking, which is like, if you inherit yeah. it from your family. Another thing, I remember when my mum used to cook, she used to blaze uh, Punjabi songs and Hindi songs loud, man. Like she needed that. Yeah. She needed that. Is there, yeah. stuff, is there stuff you bump whilst, you, whilst you're cooking? Oh, everybody knows my kitchen is live. Okay. Yeah, everybody knows my kitchen is live. If I'm playing music, I'm banging music. You know what I'm saying? What's, what's on rotation at the moment? Oh, my gosh. See, right now, because I'm DJing, I'm listening to everything. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I listen to everything. I keep it on a swivel. When a project comes out, I'll pay attention. Then it's worth paying attention to. I'll pay attention to. I think the last thing I paid attention to was um fucking Freddie Gibbs album with Bad Lip. That one, yeah. Oh man, Bandana. that shit touched my heart, bro. That touched my heart. Oh man, 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 I love that guy. Kind of shit. Me too, man. <laughs> Me too. One of my favorite albums. I know it's only been out for whatever over a year or whatever, but back in the day, we'd hear a tribe. You'd hear Low End Theory. It didn't take you three or four or five years to say that's a classic because the amount of times I'm playing that shit makes it a classic. It's the same thing with Bandana. Yeah, man. I put Bandana on. Yeah, same thing with Bandana, man. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But, 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 but obviously being from the UK, is there a UK dish? Is there a, what, what, What's the UK dish that you would say translates well for people you cook for over there? Um, you know, fish and chips, of course. <laughs> of course. Fish and chips, of course. You know what I'm saying? But um, I'm, uh, nobody likes UK food. It's disgusting. <laughs> The only good food in the UK is Indian food, bro. You know that. (laughs) (laughs) Jerobi, man. Jerobi, trust me. It has slam and Indian food, though. Like, the Indian food in the UK is amazing, bro. Yeah, man. If you you come round, if you come, come, I will take you to my house and feed you. Honestly, the food. I I grew up in a good, good food situation, as did my wife. Like, my wife's uh, uh, dad is also a a chef, so I hear these things of... Oh, right on. So, so, yeah, man, there's there's a love for food in the household. And hip hop, so this works really well. Do, do you remember when you came to the UK? Like, is there memories you have of the UK that you you really uh, hold tight? <laughs> I yeah, I have a lot of fond memories of the UK. I love, I, I love it. Yeah, man. Um, from eating West Indian food in Brixton, nice to chilling to chilling out with uh, a girl on campus at her school. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All, all kinds of shit. Yeah. I had mad fun. There's some good food places in London as well. Not just London, but trust me, food's leveled up, man. It's all from the immigrants. It's all, all the food is from the <laughs> And then we then we vote for Brexit. And did we realise that all these people who aren't going to come into our country are, are we're just going to be stuck with pies again and chips and no yeah, one, yeah, yeah. one needs that bar food? Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, but just talk on on the food tip. I noticed there's a lot. There's a big resurgence in veganism generally, and clearly that's filtered into into rap and hip hop and even Primo when he was battling RZA the other day on IG. They talked about veganism. Rizza and him were talking about veganism. Are you, are you yourself? Are you a vegan? And what do you think it seems? Why do you think it seems to be taking on in, in rap? Um, fuck no, never. <laughs> I, I look. I don't. Um, it's a healthier lifestyle. It's a healthier way to live. And I understand it. I'm, I don't. I wouldn't tell you not to be a vegan. You know what I'm saying? But as a chef and what I do and how I do it, nah. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't work for me. Now, now. Now, I do limit, but I'm never going to say, oh, I'm just not eating no meat. No, that's never going to happen. Because if I want a hamburger, we're always going to get a hamburger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's fair. That's fair. I'd be, I'd be a vegan and only eat hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> a flex, <laughs> a flexitarian. I like that. I like that. Just you know, flex when you want to. I love it. Like, um, I think it's taking off because like a lot of uh, Black people traditionally have health issues that are definitely directly related to how we live and how we eat. And be, being that most of the opponents are black that you're talking about that's something that's really important for them to kind of get out and stress because the way that our, our parents and society has taught us to eat is really detrimental to our lives because it's just a healthy way to live and it's really good you know what i'm saying and a lot of people don't have the access to medical resources because of where our fucking country is set up yeah. so they have to do things to make sure that they're you know what i'm saying they can't just fuck off and go to the doctor if they get sick they have to do all these preventative measures and living that lifestyle is a really good way not to deal with a lot of those, you know, food related health issues. Yeah. But I think a lot of, I think a lot of, you know, the part of hip hop maturing is we go through a, a adult shit now, you know what I'm saying? So people are talking about the things they're going through and that's the beauty, that's the beauty of hip hop. So mate, thank you so much to everyone. 
talking through this. Uh, we could have talked for a lot longer, I'm sure. But yeah, I just wanted to ask, if I gave you a time machine, right, and it drops you back mm-hmm. at a certain point in your life, first question, would you risk taking a ride? And two, if you did, where would you like to be dropped off and why? Um, if I had a time machine, I wouldn't move I wouldn't move back. I would move forward. There's nothing back there for me. You know what I'm saying? All the things, all of the mistakes, all of my successes, all those things lead up to the person that I am today. You know what I'm saying? And the man sitting the man sitting here today, I'm very comfortable in my skin and I'm happy. You know what I'm saying? And that's a lot of people aren't just Aren't, aren't genuinely happy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think of my stresses and they're very low. You know what I'm saying? I'd go into the future just to kind of see what my son and my kids are doing. You know what I'm saying? But other than that, I'm very happy now. And then, and now is the most beautiful thing in the world. That's brilliant, man. When you say about the future, then is there something that, like what is next for you? Like what avenue do you still want to explore? Is there an avenue you want to explore? Or what, what, what's the situation well, for you? It, DJ, this DJ thing is new and it's fun. That's new for me right now. Mm. And what's behind that? Going back into DJ, what's back? What's the renewed love about? Yo, man. Um, I wanted. I <laughs> so I so I hate the music business. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate the music business, and I wanted to do something musical that they can't control. That's great. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I wanted. And DJ is a. Is, I don't want to have to go through a whole bunch of steps to be able to touch people. And shit. You know what I'm saying? I can just go directly to the source. It's like, I, you know, I don't need, I don't need a lot. I just want people to leave me feeling better than they did when they came in. You know what I'm saying? I always want that. I always want you to leave the room feeling better than you came in the room. You know what I'm saying? That's just my personality. But um, yeah, so that's a great way to do it. And it's fun. It's chat, you know, the new technology is really, it's, it's making me interested in it as well. Every day it's new. It's something new. Like, you know what I'm saying? How are you finding the IG thing? Like the Instagram thing? Uh, I'm, I've been there since day one. So I'm comfortable. All oh, right, cool. Because see, this is the difference. I wasn't on Instagram at all. Twitter was kind of my social network, and, and even that I was limited to it. And then obviously podcast comes along. You have to promote this kind of stuff to get people the reach. Uh, so we hit all platforms, and we've been going for just less than a year. And Instagram, yeah, wow. Like there's there's a lot of moments in there that I've realized. See, I didn't I didn't know you'd been doing it for so long because then you look at it, you think, oh yeah, that's why it sounds it seems very casual. Your your lives are wicked i can put that on at work and listen and you're bringing and that's another thing is relinquishing control i have a very big problem with with a spotify playlist or my cds or records or whatever it is and and being wanted to keep in control of what i listen to when i can just put something on and i trust someone solely like a dj like yourself and think Do you know what i'm ready just bring it and and that's one mm-hmm. thing in this lockdown that i've realized is is i'm relinquishing a lot of control to people like yourself uh, jazz jeff People, people who who were jumping on, D nice. These people are jumping on and, and genuinely very entertaining, mm. very entertaining. Mm. Mm. That's dope. That's a dope. That's a dope thing to come out of this thing. With. The, the, the submission. That's dope because every every human needs experience submission to be to know how to lead. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very good point. You need to know both. Right? You need to experience it all. And talking of experience, you talk there about your son. I, I, I have a young lad as well. I'm sure your kids are older and stuff. And do you remember, like, if there was a moment when you played hip hop to those guys, and you maybe thought, ah, maybe a bit too young? Because I'm, I, I might be going through that. Do you remember having that moment? Nah, because I could play my records because we didn't curse for years. There's so there's a very, there's so many few curses. We only started cursing like now because we're grown men. But <laughs> back in those days, we weren't really, we weren't really cursing our records, so I could play all of my stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. And um, I was making beats back then too. So you know, my son was. Definitely, my son was definitely, uh, definitely into it. I got a, I got a video of my son. When he's like two and a half, three years old, and I'm doing a beatbox. Oh wow! Because you know. I taught him how to do the beatbox. Yeah, <laughs> as a baby, I taught him how to do the beatbox. My wife was like, "Why are you doing that? He's going to be doing that." Exactly. <laughs> the new Rozelle. I love that. Oh, yeah, man. yeah so. that's dope. That's but he's dope. making beats. He's he's making beats now. We, we're making songs together. It's 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 so crazy. He's fourteen. And he's like, you know, what I'm saying, oh, God, it's so. Crazy. That is beautiful, man. That's a beautiful thing. The next evolution. I love it, man. I love it. So, Jerobi, thank you again for dropping by. If you have anything ever, is there something you want to plug? Is there something you want to plug right now? Nah, nah. I'm not a. I'm not a plug. I'm, I'm the worst at that. <laughs> um, just you know, y'all know where to find me. And if you're interested, come look at me. You know, what I'm saying that's it. 
That's nice, man. I like it. But if you ever want to jump back on, if you want to talk about album, if you ever just like, you know what? Yeah, fancy having a chat. Hit us up, man. We're always here and we've got the time right now. So, <laughs> uh, but before. Thank we you leave, so much. Thank you, man. Thank you. This has been uh, incredibly enjoyable just to talk to you and talk through a lot of this stuff that I've loved and I know the listeners have loved. One thing then, before you leave, we always ask the same question. What's the last great piece of music you heard? Could be old, could be new, but just the last great piece. Last great piece of music I heard that I personally listened to, or just like I feel like I've heard, you know, the scope of great music. Like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that you've, that's you've the last pers- great thing I listened uh, to. Yeah, personally listened to. Yeah. Damn. Oh, man. God, I got to think about that. I'm so hard. It's so hard for me to pull. So hard for me to pull those. No, nah, no, nah, it's all good. It's all good. Don't worry. It's all good, man. Well, thank you, Jerobi, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. Stay yourself. We need people like you, you know, just out there. This is what keeps hip hop alive. Like people like yourself, people like Tribe. Appreciate you. Appreciate all your work. And yeah, big thank ups. You and your, and your, thank you and your listeners for indulging me and, you know, so listening to my ramblings. That, <laughs> trust me, they will be loving this. They will be loving this. I know I loved it. So it's all good. But Jeremy, thank you. Please stay safe. We love you, man. Uh, you too. Big up to the family and uh, big up to Tip and uh, Ali Shaheed, everyone else. And yeah, man, hopefully we catch you on the flip side, man. Thank you, man. Peace. Thank you. Peace. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yo, it's your original South London Trooper Black Twang, a.k.a. Tony Rotten. And right now, you're rocking with Crate 808 Podcast. You already know it's going to be fire. Enjoy this week's episode. Make sure you remember to subscribe, rate, review, and just keep spreading the word. Bless. Well, 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 there you go. Jerobi White smashed it out of the park. Tribe Core Quest member in on the Crate 808 Podcast. I, for one, am absolutely loving that conversation. Maybe it was just me, but I indulged a lot of the stuff I wanted to ask. So uh, yes, people out there, hope you enjoyed this episode. Please tell everyone about it. Crate808.com for all your Crate808 needs. Go on our Instagram, go on our Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. We're growing, we're growing, but we can only grow with your help. So please tell your friends to tell a friend, uh, subscribe, rate, review. And obviously just we're out here for the love, man. So any feedback is great. And yes, we're in lockdown, but we kind of bring you some entertainment to keep you going. Now go and listen to some Tribe Called Quest, because that's what I'm going to do. And I might eat some eggs. I might actually eat some eggs whilst I do it. Cut the ham, though. Cut the ham. Shout out to Grindhouse Music uh, for doing all the music on here. So peace out. Take it easy. Catch you on the flip side. Boom. Boom. <laughs>